Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Washington Institute uh, for Near East Policy. Uh, I'm Matt Levitt, and I have the honor of being the director of the Reinhardt Program on Counterterrorism and Intelligence here at the Washington Institute. And it's a real pleasure to uh, have you all here today and to have our guest speaker, Edmund uh, Fitton Brown. Uh, Edmund is a former longtime uh, British diplomat, and he's the coordinator of the UN's Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team concerning the Islamic State, uh, Al Qaeda, and the Taliban. So this is a team that tracks and reports on implementation of Chapter 7 sanctions against UN-designated groups and affiliated individuals in support of the 1267 Committee. Uh, and within the UN, it's responsible for assessing the global threat uh, from these groups. Previously, uh, Edmund served as British ambassador to Yemen, as regional counselor for the Arabian Peninsula, uh, among other postings in Riyadh, in Cairo, in Kuwait, and in other locations. So uh, Edmund, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming in from New York uh, for the day to do this. It's a pleasure to have all of you uh, here in person and anybody who's watching on the live stream. With no further ado, before the Q&A, Edmund, for your opening remarks. Thanks very much, Matt. And um, forgi forgive me if I have, have a slight cold and therefore some calibrating the, the volume of my voice may be tricky, so let me know if I'm not uh, clear enough or indeed if I'm deafening. Um, so it's a, it's a huge pleasure and an honor to be here um, and, and to join the illustrious list of speakers uh, here at this, uh, at this institute. It's uh, Really, really great to um, to see you all uh, and to uh, cover this important subject. Uh, Matt's given me a, a lavish introduction, so I won't say anything more uh, about my own background. Just to say that it, it, it was it was obviously a very helpful background to have, um, both in um, uh, in, in counterterrorism and in uh, cross cutting international security issues. Um, a useful background to have to coming to this job. So it was, a, it sort of felt like a, a fairly logical move um, when I moved on from the, from the British government. I should tell you a little bit about the background to the monitoring team, which was established in 2004 to support the UN Security Council committee charged with um, implementing sanctions on uh, Al Qaeda and the Taliban at that time. Um, and that, that itself sprang out of Resolution 1267. That was the sort of the father resolution for us. Um, and that was the resolution from 1999 that followed the attacks on the US uh, embassies in East Africa. Um, so uh, we were then constituted to provide the necessary uh, support for the committee in 2004. And then you have a succession of update resolutions and sort of, you know, an evolving, evolving mandate, effectively. Um, and the key moments in that evolution were 2011, when resolutions 1988 and 1989 separated the Committee for the Al-Qaeda from the Committee for the Taliban. And the theory of that, of course, was that, you know, the, you, you were looking to address the Taliban as uh, a future um, player in uh, Afghan politics, um, and therefore not to associate it directly with uh, Al Qaeda, which was still being regarded, still is regarded as a, just a, an out and out international terrorist organization. Um, and then in 2015, um, of course, because ISIL by then had emerged as the, uh, as you, know, so you remember the sort of, um, uh, very rapid and uh, uh, and very uh, startling um, emergence of ISIL, and so th the the resolution in uh, 2015 added ISIL to the Al Qaeda committee, and ISIL has tended to dominate that committee ever since then. Although we we now try to make sure that we're not we haven't moved too far the other way because Al Qaeda has certainly not gone away and remains uh, a major issue. Um, so we, we now call the committees the 1267 Committee for uh, ISIL al-Qaeda, the 1988 Committee for the Taliban. And um, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the work of the monitoring team and the methodology 
Um, and then most of what I'll be saying will be on the on the threat, uh, the threat assessment. Um, so we are um, quite a small team. There's only 10, uh, 10 sort of core members of the team employed on the basis that the UN call, calls experts. Um, what they really mean by that is independent experts. The, the, the emphasis is more perhaps on independent than it is on expert. But um, but what, what they're saying is that they employ us to say whatever is true about these issues and not to suppress what we find or what we believe um, for political reasons. And uh, obviously, if, it, if we were UN staff members, then, you know, you've got a boss and the boss has a boss and, and, and there's a risk that, you know, you end up self-censoring. So that's the, that's the reason that we're formulated the way we are. We still have a lot of support from the UN staff more or less doubling our strength. I, 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 you, it's, it's a complicated calculation, uh, but, but, but we pro we're probably almost 20 in terms of our real day-to-day -day operating strength. Um, and we support the Security Council, um, it, it, I think it, I'd say in two principal ways. Um, one of them is um, assessing the global threat from ice al Qaeda in, in biannual reports um, and in regular oral briefings to the uh, committee. Um, and we also draft the threat part of the UN Secur Secretary General's uh, biannual report on ISIL. Um, and then also once a year, um, we report on uh, the Taliban uh, and the threat that it poses to peace and security in Afghanistan. So that's the threat assessment part. The other part is, uh, again, as Matt said, uh, is to do with the sanctions lists, um, collecting information from member states on individuals, groups and entities uh, on both lists, um, keeping those lists accurate, relevant, detailed enough for conclusive identification if somebody presents themselves to a border official or uh, tries to open a bank account or whatever it might be. Um, and obviously the information both on the listed individuals and groups and on the threat, it primarily resides in member states with their uh, intelligence and security services, their CT agencies, and so hence that, 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 that's where we have to uh, make most of our uh, efforts um, in talking to those agencies. Uh, we travel a lot. Um, uh, we, we are, when we travel, we're looking to gain information about uh, about people on the lists um, to make sure that, you know, as I say, over time, these lists are getting better. They're still not perfect, but every time we travel, we are traveling with a sheaf of entries and looking for any new information that the member state can provide, photographs, fingerprints, um, more identifying detail to get to the point where you you don't have that nightmare scenario where someone presents with a name that could be a thousand different people because it's too, it's too common a name. Um, so that's that's that, that's that side of it. Um, the two are exist in balance with each other, um, but for reasons I'll come to, the threat assessment perhaps has has um, has has grown uh, over time. Perhaps was the was the minority task, whereas these days I think it's it's at least co-equal. Um, there are a couple of subsidiary things that we do that I'll just mention. Preparing and presenting recommendations to make the sanctions measures, um, the asset freeze, the arms embargo, the travel ban uh, more effective. Um, and the recommendations that we produce uh, can be quite influential because the UN, when it's uh, gathering the feedstock for new Security Council resolutions on counterterrorism, will always look at these recommendations and make use of them if they can. Um, so so that's, uh, that we take that side of things very seriously. Um, and, and also, I think, I think it's probably fair to say that we have a support role in the wider UN objective of uh, enhancing international counterterrorism cooperation. And one of the particular ways that we do that is that we, we convene regional meetings of uh, counterterrorist agencies um, and uh, have found that in the process of doing so, apart from the fact that it's a very efficient way for us of accessing a number of member states at once, um, we also find that that very often creates relationships which didn't exist. And, and you know, I think some of you may find that surprising, some not. But, um, <coughs> but my experience over many, many years uh, is that it's remarkable how undeveloped counterterrorism cooperation is. You know, when you think uh, when you think the uh, what a high, what an imperative there is to get it right. Uh, it's not as uh, 
um, is not as developed as it needs to be. In terms of our <coughs> MO, <coughs> we, we work with member states, um, as I said, um, with UN missions and agencies, uh, hold quite a wide, wide range, um, other relevant bodies like Interpol, um, uh, civil aviation organizations like IATA, ICAO, um, uh, World Customs Organization, Financial Action Task Force, and its regional style bodies. Um, and some representatives of the private sector, you know, some some ones that would be fairly obvious, uh, like financial institutions, but uh, but also you know relevant non-financial businesses and professions. For example, when the issue of um, of ISIL um, abusing uh, cultural artifacts and antiquities um, became acute, um, it was important to reach out to the to the international um, antiques uh, industry and sort of you know to to to, to learn. Because we, in a sense, again, we were connecting through to the recommendations where we would be helping to suggest that things could be done that could actually help um, to uh, to suppress that particular potential source of terrorist finance. Um, and then also within the UN, <coughs> we uh, we work with uh, there's a whole range of of UN bodies that work on counterterrorism. Uh, the most recent and the largest is the Office of Counterterrorism, which is headed up by an Under Secretary General. Um, and um, and then there is also uh, the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate, um, which is uh, subordinate to the Security Council as we are. Um, but all of these organisations need to work together because the UN, uh, for the purposes of you know just efficiency and um, and and responsible spending of money and credibility, uh, needs to demonstrate that it's not operating in silos, it's not duplicating needlessly. Um, we also work with the UN Office of Drugs and Crime um, and a whole range of um, people who are signatories to the Global Compact, uh, which basically loosely binds together all of the UN entities that have a role on counterterrorism. Now, as I said before, we are explicitly mandated to consult in confidence with member states' intelligence and security services, and that does distinguish us from other UN entities um, and means that we offer a, a significant niche capability to the UN's overall counterterrorism effort. And our assessment of the threat informs uh, the uh, work of the other UN entities. Um, and one way of one way of uh, thinking of it is that with UNOCT having grown to you know very significant size uh, with a very significant budget, um, the decisions that are made about how to spend that money, where to build capacity in member states needs to be informed by um, properly validated um, advice uh, and they get that from CTED on the needs assessment where member state, you know, CTED will say, you know, we've, we, we judge that it's very important to build this particular capacity in this particular member state. But for CTED to do that, they also need an internationally validated uh, threat assessment because, you know, you can't, you, can't, uh, you can't assess preparedness to meet a threat in a vacuum. You need to know what the threat is. Um, and so that, that becomes our role that we sort of, we're sort of upstream and providing the threat assessment that then cascades down and has that, um, has that uh, informing effect and uh, validating effect on the decisions made by bigger UN bodies. Um, as I said, we do these closed regional meetings. Um, they, they can be very effective and they're also a, a really useful reminder um, of uh, of the the way that member states do and don't talk to each other, and because of our role in that, we also get involved in some of the bigger meetings, which are called uh, by the UN every two years to have a what they call a high level event, but it's a global meeting of um, sort of heads of intelligence and national security coordinators and such like, um, and and we have a key role in in that because those are essentially our constituents. Um, and we also uh, always attend the um, there's a there's a conference which the Russians organise once a year, um, which again is a global in its scope um, and again very very useful. And we have a we have a fairly prominent role in that. Um, we're also mandated by various resolutions to develop information on specific issues during our consultations with member states. So foreign terrorist fighters or FTFs, I'll probably say, people trafficking and sexual violence in conflict. 
uh, illicit trade in antiques and cultural property, as I said, uh, terror finance in general, um, links between terrorism and organized crime, uh, terrorist acquisition of arms, uh, and threats to the security of aviation. So those are sort of, if you like, sort of um, components to what we try to consult on when we're, when we're doing this. Moving across to the threat itself, um, I'll draw on the 25th report, which, um, as you know, um, has recently been published, um, which we actually completed at the end of December. Um, it covers the second half of 2019, <coughs> but, but I'll, I'll also mention one or two events from earlier in the year that seem still to resonate. Obviously, first of all, the, the really big one, the military defeat of ISIL um, in eastern Syria in March 2019. Um, that, was, that was, I think, a huge shaping event, um, partly because of the end of the geographical caliphate, which was a really important thing, you know, sort of, I should say so-called caliphate. Um, but, um, you know, that was, I, th I think, to, to, to remove that abuse from the face of the earth was, I think, a, a very uh, positive development. But of course, a lot of things happened as a result of it, um, including um, a larger than expected, perhaps, movement of refugees and fighters. Um, and so you have, you know, then obviously problems that have flowed from that, the overcrowding of the al Hal camp, a whole range of other um, facilities, and, and creating um, what is obviously a security challenge, but is also, uh, of course, primarily a humanitarian challenge because you've got a huge number of people here who are affected who who um, who are caught up in this um, to some degree against their against their will um, secondly um, uh, I j again I just just mentioned now but we'll return to the point about um, the Sri Lanka attacks in April um, because that on Easter Sunday was 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 obviously a very very big event coming back to the present day um, in Syria, where the government has taken, retaken control, um, there is a lot of unrepaired damage, there's alienation, and, and only really an uneasy peace. Um, and of course, in Iraq, there are also a number of severe problems, um, overcrowded detention facilities, an overloaded judicial system, internally displaced persons, uh, intercommunal tensions, uh, a reconstruction deficit, uh, which of course is also uh, huge in Syria, um, and then you know nearby in Turkey you have you have this concern about the fate of uh, you know three and a half million um, Syrian refugees. So these are these are massive massive issues. Um, ISIL's covert network uh, in Syria has been being re-established um, at the provincial level. Obviously, they knew that the defeat was coming and you know Baghouz was just the the sort of coup de grace in a way but they had plenty of time to think about what 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 that would look like and what they should do and they'd been doing it in Iraq since 2017 as well so in its core area ISIL is adapting consolidating and creating conditions for an eventual resurgence um, that's the objective um, and encouraged by political tension, I guess, practical disconnect between some of its state adversaries. Um, ISIL is operating ever more openly and confidently um, in recent months. Um, northwestern Syria should be particularly mentioned as a, uh, you know, a highly problematic place, both from political and security and humanitarian perspectives. Um, uh, one of our member state interlocutors described it as the world's largest dumping ground for FTFs. Um, there are certainly a lot of FTFs there. Um, the current military escalation has displaced large numbers of civilians. Um, you've got a situation where the main, the most powerful group in the region is Al-Qaeda aligned. It's Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, previously known as Al-Nusra Front, or you know, an evolution of Al-Nusra Front, if you like. Um, and then there's a more purist sort of globally focused al-Qaeda affiliate called Harass al-Din, Guardians of Religion. Um, and these groups are determined to resist um, the, uh, the, effect, the advances of the, uh, of the um, authorities in Damascus and their allies. Um, ISIL is present in the area, 
but they, this is not their fight. They, 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 will, they will use the area for facilities for as long as they can, um, and, uh, and, and they certainly won't try to, they won't aim to lose any personnel trying to defend ground in that part of Syria. So the return, I think the return to normal in Iraq and the Levant will not be easy. Um, the, one fears that there is always going to be some space that is exploitable by extremists. Now, the other major event of 2019 in the core area was the killing of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in late October. Um, uh, you'll remember that, obviously, very, very vividly, so I won't say much about it. But, um, but, but he, interestingly, before, shortly before he died, he'd urged efforts to free fighters and dependents um, accommodated in the various camps and facilities in the, in the region. Um, and it's worth, worth remembering that, partic- that sort of legacy um, call from him before he died. Um, the existing provisional holding arrangements of ISIL-linked detainees and internally displaced persons um, and refugees of general, general refugees by local uh, Kurdish-led militias are very precarious arrangements. Um, and you know, quite a few uh, fighters dis- uh, had escaped in October, you know, because of because of um, geostrategic events affecting the region. Um, the general feeling in the international community is that this is, this should serve as a wake up call to address this problem as being you know the urgent problem that it is, um, and that perhaps um, perhaps the sort of the precariousness of the situation will incentivize a a more durable solution. Um, Many ISIL leaders are alive and hiding still uh, in Iraq um, and, uh, and in Syria and some slightly further afield. Um, ISIL is, discriminates between its personnel. It's very striking that since it entered its sort of final military death throes um, that uh, it started to see foot soldiers and particularly FTFs or at least many FTFs as being dispensable. Um, leaders and key seniors are being protected, um, and Syrians and Iraqis are favored over foreigners. Um, and I think that somewhat cavalier attitude to the foreign contingent may, may cost them in terms of future opportunities. Um, it's worth remembering that the, uh, the, the threat from ISIL in terms of the projected international threat is very much reduced these days compared from its peak in 2015, 2016. Um, you know, of course, there are many, re- there are regular local operations in the core area and in some other conflict zones as well. Um, it, but directed international attacks are dramatically reduced, uh, as are facilitated attacks and inspired attacks. I and mean, it's one of the things that we have that we have to remember, people who observe counterterrorism or, or practitioners of counterterrorism, that sometimes you also do have to communicate where there's a relative level of success, because otherwise, you know, when things get more difficult again, then, you know, that's uh, that, that 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 you that you have to you have to you have to be clear with people that that a world without terrorism, you know, completely without terrorism, much as we would aspire to it, is is, is extremely difficult to achieve, and the relatively low level at the moment of a projected ISIL threat is a is a success of sorts. Um, now, this situation has persisted for a couple of years now, you know, 2018, 2019, the level was very much reduced. Um, I don't think this will last indefinitely. It's difficult to predict at what point the threat may rise again. But I think once it's, once its survival is assured, and I think there's some sense that it feels some confidence in the last few months that its survival is more or less assured, um, it will invest in its external operations capability. Uh, and that could happen in unexpected locations. I mean, the obvious location would be in Iraq or Syria, but um, it's not impossible. It could be elsewhere. Um, ISIL certainly has the financial reserves to assist in this when it, you know, as and when it is looking to, um, you know, sort of develop capability again. Um, it's uh, we have estimates which vary between about 100 and 300 million U.S. dollars in terms of ISIL's financial reserves. These are very approximate estimates, and they're also I should qualify that even giving those figures with, you know, how liquid are they? How available are they? Who has access to them? I and mean, these are all big questions. Um, but still, uh, it's it, it, the legacy finance from having had the resources that it once had. Um, mean that it still has the financial capability to do 
certainly more than it's currently actually operationally equipped to do and, 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 and more besides. Um, the key criteria, I think, for re reconstituting a sort of ex-ops capability um, will be the time and space in a safe haven to start to project an organized threat. We've seen some signs of this happening um, at various times in various places. Um, and in the longer term, I'm, I'm, I, I'm pretty clear that both ISIL and Al-Qaeda will want to have those strategic options for their surviving leaderships. It's interesting to note Al-Qaeda's conservatism over resourcing operations. Um, it tends to pre prioritize administration and salaries, and you know, obviously these things are important if you're going to hold the group together, and then you know, welfare payments and things of that kind. But Haras uh, in in Idlib um, has elements with external attack planning ambitions, um, including a lot of foreign terrorist fighters, but they are short of money, um, and that's, uh, that's an interesting dynamic. Um, we learned, obviously, in September that Hamza bin Laden had been killed sometime previously. Um, Ayman al Zawahiri is in poor health, so it's important to analyze in what direction Abu Muhammad al-Masri, who is the presumed successor, will take al-Qaeda um, in the medium term. Um, again, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, but going back to ISIL, um, following Baghdadi's death and the public announcement of his uh, successor, Abu Ibrahim al-Hashmi al-Qureshi, um, I think it is going to be difficult for the group to implement this leadership transition. Uh, the Arabic speakers among you uh, obviously recognize the name as a combination of nom de guerre and claimed honorifics. Um, it, it, it's effectively useless for the purpose of identification. Um, but there is unconfirmed reporting, which we, you know, we mention it in our report, uh, that Abu Ibrahim is Amr Muhammad Said Abdurrahman al-Mawla, um, who is an established ISIL senior who previously served as Baghdadi's deputy. Um, and in fact, the, I think the, the best sort of um, picture and information about him is probably the U U.S. State Department sort of most wanted. Uh, I think he's I think he's up there for five five million dollars or something of the sort. Um, and uh, and it's, so important, it will be important to establish whether 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 he is indeed the new leader. Um, Abu Ibrahim, uh, which I'll use to describe the new leader, since we can't be sure that it's Al Mawla. Um, Abu Ibrahim was, was treated to a sort of Mexican wave of pledges of allegiance from ISIL supporters around the world. Uh, and that showed um, that the ISIL propaganda operation is still in good order. Um, but of course, sustaining that level of enthusiasm may not be straightforward. Um, they may feel the need for him to speak to the, you know, to the organization, to the world. Um, and if they try to flesh him out, for their followers, then they may they may of course put him put him in danger. Um, so, so one possible one possible effect of this transition, if they are cautious about that, is perhaps to accelerate the um, uh, to accelerate the delegation of authority in the group, um, which is already happening anyway, um, uh, from the core to the affiliates. Um, and so, even if even if the strategy in the core remains constant, I think that probably that trend will be, ex will be accentuated. But the organization, you know, ISIL, ISIL is well supported um, and I, it is expected to endure, um, even if in an increasingly divergent global form. Um, so I mentioned these Sri Lanka attacks um, Easter Sunday um, uh, last year um, as an important sort of case study of that sort of global, um, uh, global sort of networked threat. Uh, or inspired threat. Um, ISIL Corps knew nothing about those attacks uh, in advance, and Baghdadi referred to them in his late April uh, video, but it was a tacked on audio sort of PS, um, an afterthought. Um, but the fact of the matter is that an ISIL inspired group had incubated in Sri Lanka um, and developed a significant capability. Um, it had foreign links. Um, some of the members of the group had traveled um, to various places, including Syria. Um, but it was locally generated and financed and led. And, and the shock value and the scale of the attacks, you know, hundreds of hundreds of people dead, um, uh, that had an, uh, had an impact, um, especially as they, uh, they said that they were taking revenge 
not just for the fall of Baghouz, but also for the, uh, the Christchurch attacks. Um, and that's, that's troubling in terms of the sort of the clash of civilization sort of narrative, um, which, which could, I think, if it, uh, if it develops, could, could be, become more problematic in terms of, you know, call and response type uh, attacks. Um, at any rate, I think for sure we should expect to see more inspired attacks of this kind this year, um, and particularly now with the new motive of avenging Baghdadi's death. Um, but hopefully not on the same scale, because that was uh, was unusual. Um, the great majority of uh, inspired attacks tend to be relatively low impact if they succeed, and, and the great majority don't succeed. Um, this is one reason why ISIL needs to re revive its ex-ops capability. Um, if they, they they just can't rely on inspired attacks to for, to, to, to to always give the, the impact that they're looking for. ISIL center of gravity um, outside um, the core area and particularly in Asia is is Afghanistan. Um, and our 1267 committee recently sanctioned IS Khorasan province. Um, or ISIL K as a separate entity. Um, this is just a you know simply simply the matter of demonstrating that you know ISIL K is a sli it's slightly it's a special case in some ways. Um, uh, it's also highly relevant to what's happening uh, more broadly in Afghanistan. Um, despite taking casualties on many fronts against Afghan security forces, coalition troops, and of course the Taliban, which has been you know hammering ISIL K. Um, Nevertheless, it is resilient, and it's been launching attacks, um, including in Kabul, with uh, an impact disproportionate to the actual numbers uh, of the group. Um, they've had a very difficult year, um, uh, and it ended um, with the near eradication of their presence in their base area of Nangarhar province in eastern Afghanistan. Um, we now assess their fighting strength as being reduced you know, to a maximum of 2,500. Um, and it's likely that the remnants from Nangarhar will come under pressure in Kunar, where a lot of them have taken refuge uh, to the north. Um, but still, it's, it, it's quite successful in recruiting. It's getting new recruits, particularly from academic institutions in Afghanistan, um, you know, including, you know, students at Kabul University and things like that. It's very troubling that it has that appeal. Um, and Afghanistan is, is certainly an arena in which ISIL might develop an external operational capability. Um, obviously, Afghanistan has got broader um, extremist issues. Uh, there are many al-Qaeda or Taliban-aligned extremist groups present. Uh, the Central Asian neighbors of Afghanistan are always worried about the potential for a cross-border threat um, uh, from these people as well as from ISIL. Um, at the moment, that threat is constrained by the Taliban because the Taliban has a strong vested interest in in being seen as a, an organization that is not seeking to, you know, is in fact actively seeking to prevent uh, Afghanistan uh, being the source of an international terrorist threat. Um, but Afghan politics and the peace process are evolving, and it's not clear what the developments in the peace process will do in terms of affecting the external threat from, Af from, from groups in Afghanistan. It's obviously vital to revive the talks and bring peace to the country. And indeed, that's the main driver for the 1988 committee work that we do. Um, but there may be a short-term cost, for example, in terms of driving tar Taliban irreconcilables to join ISIL-K, uh, or, or the affiliates who are, uh, so the, so the FTFs who are affiliated with uh, Al Qaeda or the Taliban to become more active. So I mean, there are some there are some variables there that need watching. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the the imperative to to progress that peace process is obvious. Um, so ISIL, um, in the process of this devolution that I spoke about, um, has uh, has sort of pursued something of a, a, what, what looks like a hub-and-spoke sort of approach, where they, they're pushing some authority out to the more developed remote provinces and using them as conduits for supporting some of the less developed, uh, less developed ones. Um, so, for example, IS West Africa province in, in, uh, in the Lake Chad Basin, uh, northeastern Nigeria, 
um, has grown in power and ambition, and it now claims attacks on behalf of IS Greater Sahara, uh, which is uh, which itself exists much further uh, west, um, primarily in Mali, um, into Niger, um, and a continuum of instability seems to be emerging in West Africa and the Sahel, and this is a major concern for the UN um, and the international community more generally. Um, extremists, I think, are seeking deliberately to threaten fragile regional states. Um, the Al-Qaeda-aligned coalition that calls itself Jamaat Nusrat al-Islam al muslimin JNIM, um, exploits local tensions. It takes, it takes on local issues, things like the uh, tensions that exist between uh, nomadic populations and settled populations um, and tries to exploit these and to use them as a source of radicalization and polarization um, in these in these areas and 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 they also interestingly they de deconflict with isgs greater sahara um, in mali and niger uh, and also with ansar al-islam in burkina faso and that i think that deconfliction is interesting again you know there's no sign of a reconciliation at the core level between ISIL and Al-Qaeda. And indeed, when Baghdadi died, some of the most um, brutal um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of commentary was from Al-Qaeda sort of saying, well, you know, that's, that's what happens when you, when you sort of defy, um, you know, divine will and act in that kind of, um, you know, they, they, really, they really put the boot in. Um, but there in the Sahel, uh, it's really striking that this deconfliction and even an element of uh, operation co operational cooperation exists between the groups, and it shows. I think the Al Qaeda has always been has always delegated a lot to its regional or, or regional affiliates, and and with ISIL increasingly doing the same, it means that local or regional dynamics may take over in some of these places and create, you know, unexpected um, uh, alliances of convenience. Um, we, the monitoring team, held a West African regional meeting uh, during the autumn and heard acute concerns about violent extremism in the region, some of it supported from outside. Um, and um, the wider UN and the, international, uh, and the international community, I think, is increasingly concerned about this. Um, there's clearly work needed on the wider front to boost development, um, not just counterterrorism, but you know, wider development and to bolster resilience within those um, societies, countries, uh, and um, structures of authority to avoid contagion from these terrorist groups to some of the jurisdictions on the coast of the Gulf of Guinea, uh, which are up to now relatively unaffected, but where there's, there's a clear risk of, uh, of, of contagion coming across the, their northern borders. Um, I don't have time, to obviously, to touch on all of the uh, areas of concern. You know, the team's mandate is global, um, uh, but but we can, in questions, we can go to any areas that you're interested in. Um, we could discuss other affected parts of Africa, <coughs> Yemen, um, Southeast Asia, um, Europe, of course. Um, in Europe, I will just say, I, I think that it, it's troubling that authorities seem at cross purposes and unsure how to deal with the sort of the cocktail of CT challenges that they face. Self-radicalized lone wolves, you know, domestic extremists, um, the issue of returning FTFs, um, frustrated travelers, people who would have liked to have gone to the conflict but didn't make it for one reason or another, um, and then radicalization in prisons um, and the release of extremist prisoners. So all of these things are troubling, and they and they overlap with each other and can seem quite uh, daunting, I think, in some European countries. Um, you know, the, the resources to address these issues, to make sure that you're actually managing de-radicalization programs in prison, preventing people from becoming radicalized in prison. Um, the, you know, these, these are, these, these are um, challenging even for wealthy countries. And of course, they're even more challenging for a lot of uh, developing countries. Um, and I think it's worth you know, just highlighting those two recent attacks in London over the last few months. As, um, as sort of illustrative of that particular issue where, you know, the sort of um, uh, all of the processes are ostensibly in place, but still people are, but people are still coming, people are still coming out of uh, prison, you know, and then, and then carrying out attacks. Um, 
So ISIL's military defeat and the death of Baghdadi, um, these things should be welcomed as good news. But the whole nexus of, of, of issues coming out of the period of the so-called caliphate, what to do with the people who fought for it, worked for it, lived under it, um, is a massive issue in the short term and beyond. The numbers are huge. Uh, more than 40,000 people traveled to join that fight. Um, and a rough calculation of the attrition rate suggests that you know maybe 25,000 plus uh, of those people may still be alive. Um, so the question then arises, you know, what future do they have? What do they, what's, what's their intent? Um, what might be the so-called blowback ratio? You know, how many people are determined to continue to, to try to um, carry out um, violence of one sort or another? There are detainees, there are fugitives, there are returnees and relocators. Um, uh, women who, in many cases, may be as dangerous as the men. Um, there are minors, um, and many of those are undocumented, um, and some of the older ones are hardened, brutalized. Um, so I think the international community faces short, medium, and long-term risks if, if we mishandle this in any way. Uh, it's a generational challenge, uh, and I, I, always, I always cite what for me is the personification of that was the Indonesian FTF who was killed in Syria in 2018, who was a small child when his father took part in the 2002 Bali bombing. Um, so I think I think I, you know usually when I'm talking to um, foreign foreign officials, intelligence, security personnel, I always say you know you know you may have a you may be on a tour of duty that lasts for three years or five years. Um, politicians are on an electoral cycle, but I mean, I think for the sake of um, for the sake of what the world will look like in 2040, it's very important that we we aren't trapped in the calculations that are based on this year or next year or the next just the next few years. Um, don't want to sound too pessimistic um, in all of this, but but I, I fear that I fear that the, that we'll all be interested in this job and um, this area of business and studying it for a very long time. I think the underlying conditions which created ISIL still there um, and this strain of terrorism I guess will be with us for the foreseeable future now whether that's in the form of ISIL uh, under you know new leadership um, Al-Qaeda sooner or later under a successor to Zawahiri um, or mutations sort of this the sort of the mixture of uh, uh, of sort of jihadi nationalism some people call it um, uh, you know um, Coalitions like JNIM and that sort of uh, sort of creating a slightly new uh, modus operandi and um, and sort of set of priorities, or indeed some new brand, of course, because it's not as if uh, it's not as if Islamic State was all that well known, um, you know, um, not so many years ago, and so we, we should we should be alert, I think, to the emergence of you know a, a new brand potentially as well. I, th I think I should stop there um, and give people a chance to say what you're most interested in discussing. Great, Edmund, thank you so much. Uh, that's a real tour de force. I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative and ask uh, a couple of questions, give you all time to articulate yours, and, and then we have plenty of time to get to everybody. I'll catch your, uh, you'll just signal to me, and you'll uh, then just wait for the microphone, identify yourself, and ask your question. Of course, I don't have a pen, so. Yeah, you, have a, you have a pen now. Um, I'm gonna have someone bring me another pen. <laughs> um, I got people. Um, thank you, people. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so first I want to ask you um, just a, a kind of a bureaucratic question because I don't think a lot of people know much about the monitoring uh, team. And uh, you've, got, you've got 10 experts on the team from 10 different countries. Um, and I wonder if you can tell us a little bit just about that dynamic, you know, um, uh, and how that enables you or inhibits you from having these conversations with lots of different countries in this, in this uh, kind of uh, confidential, consultative uh, mm -hmm. fashion. And then the second part to it is, is when you're having these conversations, my takeaway from your remarks is there are basically three general themes uh, in your travels. You're trying to raise awareness uh, of the sanctions regime. You're trying to maybe get countries to participate in, in generating uh, um, or nominating entities, persons or entities for potential new designations. Um, and you're also trying uh, to, uh, to, uh, to build up compliance. Mm. Um, and I was hoping you could speak a little bit to kind of those three things and 
where you're able to have more success or what some of the problems, just from a kind of wonkish, bureaucratic, you know, we don't know much about sure. your office. Yeah. So how does it work? No, it's a very fair question. I mean, and the UN, I think, generally can be quite um, impenetrable for observers from outside, uh, which is why I set out at some length of, you know, how we interact with other uh, UN entities as well. Uh, yeah, the 10 from 10, uh, it's, in it's, it's, it's interesting. We used to be eight. Um, we were inc increased to 10 in 2015, and that was in recognition of the uh, ISIL being added to the to the, uh, to the the um, 1267 committee and the recognition that it was the job got bigger at that point. Um, and um, it's, not, uh, it's not formally written down anywhere, but the practice is that there's one each from each member of the P5 on the Security Council, um, and then five others um, uh, who are picked, you know, sim more or less, um, you know, the jobs are advertised, people apply, and, um, and, and uh, you know, the, the best person is hired. Um, so um, that's, that's, how it, that's how it happens. The tours or the appointments are for a maximum of five years. So there's a, you know, 10, 10 people working for five years each. So roughly, we, so is it, I'm sorry, is it, is it coincidental that there are 10 people from 10 countries? Or is that how you try and structure it? Uh, I, th I think it's it's slightly it's not I wouldn't say coincidental. I mean, I think I think it's fairly clear that you know um, let's say that uh, let's say let's say that um, uh, I'm going to go fictitious here, but let's say that uh, well, no, actually, my my predecessor that was coordinator who was German. Um, so when um, when the German coordinator left, uh, I think you could there were six nationalities that the successor would not be. And those were German, German, or um, or uh, UK, USA, Russia, France, China. And the reason is that they deliberately avoid having more than one from any country, mm -hmm. and they also try to avoid, if they can, sort of creating the impression that the slot is is in the possession of a of a of a country. So you know, succession of one to another and of the same nationality would be unusual. Um, so so yeah, it's a but you know, it's it, 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 that's. It's a curious process, but um, but there's a f pretty good pool of people out there who are interested in the job, so that you you tend to get good candidates for for each of these positions when they come up. Then you get that point you were making about the international dynamic of this. Now, I, I think we're helped a great deal by the fact that ISIL and Al Qaeda, especially, nobody likes them, and you know ISIL more than more than Al Qaeda, perhaps. I mean, you know, sort of you. You really will not find anyone in the world who is prepared to stand up and say, well, maybe ISIL are not so bad, um, unless they're a member of ISIL. Um, and, um, and so that creates a very strong unity of mission, and that helps a lot. It means that, uh, it means that uh, commu communicating, cooperating, and motivating across, uh, across um, national barriers is not difficult. Um, we also we make sort of, I think, intelligent use of the natural access of each member. So you know you would you you would want to make you 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 wouldn't necessarily put you wouldn't necessarily send the Chinese expert on a mission to India, say, because but just because of geostrategic complexity there, you you would be sensitive to things of that kind. Um, but you know, each expert will have some natural advantages, um, and we tend we try to use that. And then I guess the, the the other point, which you must have been, I think, um, implying, is the is the issue of sort of um, security of information and confidentiality, and and that is complicated. Um, but I think there's a there's a level of confidentiality which is easy to maintain across even ten nationalities when dealing with a subject of this kind. And then you have to have some certain amount of information in reserve effectively where you may be told something and you look at it and say well that's just not something I'm going to be able to use because it's too sensitive and maybe you're told something that's something you can't even really write down because it's too sensitive so so that you know this is one of the oddities of you're dealing with agencies the agencies uh, of course they you know they filter what they tell us you know they, they're not they're not going to be you know they're, and, and they're also you know they understand what we're interested in we're not trying to be um, operational CT officers, you know, telling us that ex-terrorists might, you know, might be looking to move from this location in Syria to that location in Syria. That's not our business. Um, and nobody's going to sort of burden us with that information. But still, um, you know, they, they, so they, they'll, they'll, they'll give us what they think it is we most need to know. They'll sometimes give us things which they say, look, you know, 
I don't mind telling you this, but please don't turn that into a file note. Um, and certainly and certainly don't use it, you know, in your report on you know, your public report. And we would respect that. Um, so it, it's it's a it's an art um, and it's uh, evolving all the time, but it, it works surprisingly well, I would say. And I, I guess the main point is that I don't think we've ever had a member state come back and say, hang on a sec, we told you this thing and it was in confidence. And, you know, the next thing is that we see it, you know, in the pages of whatever. Um, I think if that happened quite quickly, people would say, well, you know, don't talk to those guys because they leak. Um, but strangely enough, we don't. Um, and then on the point about uh, raising awareness, um, new designations, compliance, all that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's complicated. The sanctions list, and I hope I gave the a sense of this when I was speaking earlier, it, it really is a work in progress. I mean, I think if you look at the sanctions list as it was, you know, 15 years ago, um, you know, an awful lot of, you know, first name unknown, surname unknown, you know, Kunya is Abu Muhammad or something, you know, and I mean, that's not going to help anybody. Um, I, I mean, it was never quite that bad, but, you know, but, but there, that, I, I'm exaggerating for effect. But increasingly, the quality of the listings is better and better. And so once you get to the point where you even start to incorporate some basic biometrics, obviously, the best thing is, you know, you want a photo if you can get a photo. But then if you can get fingerprints and, um, you know, gradually, uh, I guess technology advances are helping us in this because as you get more and more biometric travel documents and people using biometrics to access bank accounts and things like that, um, it helps. And, you know, part of our job is to stay abreast of those changes because we see how they're impacting potentially on the sanctions list. Um, so I think it is getting better. Um, nevertheless, um, you know, I think... I think we, you know, we would have to be honest and recognize that the, the number of times that a terrorist is prevented from traveling or a payment of money is prevented because of the sanctions list is not that high, and we want to increase it. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question before we open it up. Um, you know, as I think about the, uh, you know, the forecasting the scope of the threat, there's lots of reasons to be concerned. You touched on this in your remarks. You know, you know, there's one part in the beginning of the report talking about the issue of foreign terrorist fighters that estimates, um, according to member states, that between one half and two thirds of the more than 40,000 who joined the caliphate are still alive. So that means somewhere between 20 to 30,000 in your remarks, you, you, uh, you suggested 25 uh, are still alive. And then Ambassador Jim Jeffries just did a presser where he said, in the context of his concerns about Idlib and about the concerns, the various concerns about potential large refugee flows that could come out of Idlib uh, if this Syrian, Russian, Iranian, Hezbollah offensive continues, uh, one of his points is that within that refugee flow, you could have, he said, between seven to 10,000 um, he referred to them as Nusra fighters, which I assume means a combination of uh, HTS and Her uh but basically, effectively, Al Qaeda affiliated people um, leaving Idlib within that refugee um, population. So, whether you're talking about the Islamic State or you're talking about Al Qaeda, we're still talking about a, a significant number of international fighters. Not all of them are are walking freely. Some of them are, you know, incarcerated um, by the SDF or others. But can you comment on the just the kind of medium term scope of the threat mm. just in terms of the numbers we, like these we've never faced before no i mean i, I know that's absolutely right and, and and i think that point about these these being unprecedented numbers is it's a really important point um you know when we when we look at you know the history of um the build up towards um 9/11 and then the um military action in afghanistan and the association of al qaeda with afghanistan and then you know um people leaving um, you know or stay trying to stay in the region or relocating uh, or going to prison um, that was on a, as you say a, a, on a much smaller scale and yet of course that legacy was highly problematic in terms of the threat that that that, that arose from it so yeah I think we have to accept that we're dealing with a a, rec you know, a similar phenomenon but multiplied in size so that's a huge issue. Um, it makes handling it incredibly important because I mentioned this sort of blowback ratio. It's not my term. It's one. It's, it's one that is sometimes used by 
um, academics, but um, but you know, in other words, if you have ten people who go to fight in a conflict, um, and then they leave the conflict zone, you know, how many um, are sort of persistent, persistently violent, want to sort of want to carry on, you know, either mount terrorist attacks or go and find a relocate to another conflict zone, um, and 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 so you know, when you look at those issues about repatriation, for example, of um, uh, people who are currently um, stranded in um, northeastern Syria, um, how that's handled is terribly important because if it if it affects the proportion of those who subsequently just become radical, you know, become become absolutely uh, irrevocable radicals, that's a huge problem. Now, um, going to those numbers, um, yeah, twenty five thousand is a sort of you know, sort of convenient uh, shorthand. It's it's obviously imprecise. Um, you talked about where where those people might be. Some of them some of them will have just gone off to try and uh, you know just try and avoid ev- evade evade justice. Basically, um, we see we see a few cases of this where people have you know joined diaspora communities in slightly unexpected locations um, just to be somewhere where they might be able to find people who speak their language and where they might be able to find work and, and in many cases they're not, there's no intention there to um, you know to carry out further attacks but in some cases that might then become a sort of money might be sent from you know in back into the conflict zone or back to their um, back to their compatriots um, so um, so that's one factor. You mentioned people in prison. It's worth mentioning that so many FTFs, of course, were convicted, particularly in uh, Western countries, convicted of uh, relatively minor offences um, to do with the, uh, the the difficulty of assembling uh, evidence for more serious charges or, or, or securing convictions. Um, and so, again, that plays into the prison radicalization, prison releases issue. Uh, an awful, I th- I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very large number of uh, imprisoned returnees will be released in, in Europe this year. So that's that's a big issue, big preoccupation for the um, for the authorities. The point about um, Idlib and Turkey um, uh, and refugee flows, yes, I mean that's 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 it's it's a, it's a clear concern. Uh, I mentioned the fact that um, that Nusra, as, as Jim uh, described them, I think you're right. I think he was referring to HTS and H and, and HAD. Um, I think their first intent is to fight. You know, there's a fairly strong feeling, I think, in those groups that, uh, you know, they, they can't really run away from this conflict. There, there isn't really anywhere very, very obvious to go. Um, and so I think they will fight for as long as they can. And there's a, I think there's some sense amongst them that, you know, that it's, it's going to be difficult for the authorities in Syria to really control the country again. And therefore, you know, there will be space somewhere for them, you know, to... to to hide and look out for a better time, maybe. Um, so I, I would expect in the first instance, even if there was a significant movement of refugees, uh, I don't think there'd be too many from from HAD and HTS amongst them. I, I think what what I what I tried to say in the presentation is I think that ISIL would certainly be amongst. You know, they they would they would exploit any flow of that kind immediately because they have no interest in fighting for ground there. Um, and yeah, you know, if if, if it goes ugly enough, I, I guess yeah, people will. People will leave, and that will include extremists. Um, very, very troubling. Uh, very troubling for Turkey, um, and of course, you know that question about what that does to the dynamic inside Turkey and the number of refugees inside Turkey. Uh, also, really very problematic. So, I think, I think, to sort of finish the answer, um, I think we we definitely have to accept that the ambient threat from people with um, conflict zone experience as FTFs is definitely going to be higher in the period ahead than it has been over the past 20 years. Um, and we need to get on the front foot as far as we can uh, to try to uh, mitigate that threat as far as possible. But it is going to be very important for governments to educate um, their um, to educate their populations that, you know, that the that the idea that, you know, that, that ISIL is, is, is defeated and that there won't be a threat and that at some point, you know, terrorism will will sort of reduce to lower levels than it's at at the moment. Uh, to my mind, that's not a sustainable argument. Okay, let me open it up to the audience now, and I'll catch your uh, you'll catch my attention. And I'll call on you, and you'll just wait for a mic, please. We'll start right over here in the middle, my colleague. 
We'll come around. I see you. Hi, <coughs> uh, Roy Gutman. I'm an affiliate associate here with the uh, Institute. Um, I was astonished by your statement that there might be as many as 25,000 <coughs> um, ISIL, <coughs> ISIL uh, supporters out there. <coughs> um, when you consider five years of, uh, of uh, military operations, $28 billion in expenditure and at least 30 something thousand <coughs> projectiles fi fired against them. Um, it, it makes you wonder whether we were doing the right thing. I had some questions basically about uh, Idlib, uh, center on Idlib. <coughs> um, you mentioned uh, Baghdadi. Uh, and can you, could you just, uh, do you know in your own mind, uh, why was he seeking, uh, why was he there? Why was he in hiding? Was he hoping to go to Turkey? Did he plan to stay for a while, or do you have, have you been able to put that together? Did he have any support of any kind <clears throat> from the Al-Qaeda forces who more or less uh, uh, dominate that area? Uh, and, and, and how do, by the way, how do they, if they don't have a lot of money, how do they sustain themselves? Um, do they have any outside support? Do they uh, just ta tax the population? Um, th th you know, they're a bit of a mystery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, taking those points in order, um, the 25,000 figure, I should stress that that's, you know, that, that is not a statement of how many fighters are sort of currently in the theater. It's very different from that. It's a, that figure is entirely specific to the FTFs who traveled to join the fight. And um, it's based on uh, speaking to member states about their assessment of the attrition rate for their um, for their nationals who went, and uh, when and to be clear, based on the report, it's not the number of people out there still fighting; it's the number yeah. of people alive. Alive, exactly. A significant number of these are incarcerated. Absolutely, at least, yeah. at least so, for now. Absolutely. So, so when Matt said between a half and two thirds, um, that sort of difference between fifty and sixty-six percent, if you like, sixteen percent, um, that's the sort of that's the uh, unaccounted for factor that we get. So whenever we talk to member states, they'll tell us something along the lines of, you know, well, we think 40% of our nationals have, or maybe 50% of our nationals have been killed, um, uh, or whatever, whatever the proportion is. Um, and then there are some who are unaccounted for. Um, so, so, sorry, yeah, the other way around. So maybe 40%, 40 have been killed and then some that are unaccounted for, something along those lines. Um, and... As Matt says, where those people are is another matter. Many of them have already returned home. So some of them are incarcerated in their home countries. Some of them are in their home countries and just simply have a tag on them as being suspect individuals. And as I say, increasingly, people you'll get people who have been incarcerated and then released in their home countries. And then you're going to have people who are relocators. They've gone elsewhere. They may have gone to another conflict zone, but we haven't found that was a major um, you know, at one point, the international community was very preoccupied that a lot of these people would travel to go and fight in Afghanistan or travel to go and fight in Yemen or in Libya or wherever it might be. Um, but actually, that sort of relocating fighter has not been a major factor in any of the other conflict zones up to now. Maybe over time, it's still true, for example, to say that there are more uh, Central Asian fighters in Syria with Afghan experience than there are Central Asian fighters in Afghanistan with Syrian experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is a, this flow of relocators, maybe it's just a very slow flow, and eventually that will reverse. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, so, so that's, just to, that, that's just to give a sense of where these people all over the place doing all sorts of different things. Some of them probably not a threat, but, you know, but, you, you know, but nevertheless, some of them are. Um, and then remember, of course, that the great majority of supporters of ISIL in Syria and Iraq will be Syrians and Iraqis. Um, you know, and this is really important not to forget. We tend to obsess over foreign terrorist fighters, but in terms of the uh, in terms of the threat in Syria and Iraq and the risk of a resurgence, it's the Syrians and the Iraqis who matter more. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, I, I still think that you know the international community did do the right thing in pursuing a military campaign against ISIL because I think the very existence of that geographical entity was such a scar on the face of the earth. I mean, it was such a, it was such a, it was such a screaming abuse to 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 to, to religion to 
you know, to, 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 to the countries of the region, it, it, removing it, even though it doesn't remove the fact that there is still support for ISIL, it's still, I think, a very important piece of progress. Um, Idlib and Baghdadi, um, to be brief, I don't have a huge amount of detail of that kind, but ISIL has significant facilities in the Idlib area, and Idlib, not just Idlib, but sort of round the corner and in, into Aleppo as well, so essentially northwestern Syria. Um, and uh, ISIL sees those areas as being key for facilitation, and indeed some of the people who have uh, left uh, holding facilities in the northeastern Syria have been directed towards um, Aleppo and Idlib areas. Um, so I think that's the way that ISIL sees it. Why was Baghdadi there? I mean, I, I think because they had such robust facilita facilities, they were able to have him there as a safe location. I don't think there was any suggestion that he was on his way elsewhere. I think that was that was just the that was just the best place for him to hole up. And of course, the precautions around him and trying to protect him from the security risk of communication and people knowing where he was uh, meant that that was a pretty elaborate process. Perhaps no surprise that we didn't know until such time as, you know, it was suddenly announced that he had been found and killed. Um, support from Haras ad uh, as you said, uh, some people have spoken about that. They've said, you know, is there a sort of a, was there some sort of role of Haras ad you know, in helping uh, ISIL to hide Baghdadi. Um, I think the way I would characterize my understanding of the dynamic in the region is that you have these groups which are rivals to each other um, and to some degree enemies to each other, but also uh, very aware that they're under external assault and therefore that if they're fighting each other, you know, it's, a, you know, it's, it's an element of sort of fish in a barrel and if the fish fight each other as well, then you know they really their chances are not great. Um, so um, I think I think there's an element of mutual tolerance, deconfliction, uh, boundaries that are set in terms of operational activity or attempts to expand your own areas of authority. I'm sure that HTS and HAD have a pretty good idea of which uh, villages or <coughs> farms or you know, houses, buildings um, are sort of ISIL facilities, but they don't necessarily have the bandwidth to go in and try and, you know, is, is, picking another fight there is just not maybe the best thing to do when, when you're under uh, external assault. So I think it's probably more in that nature. Um, and then the point about money, um, I wanted, when I said HAD is poor um, or, you know, has limited resources, that was very specific to HAD. I didn't mean HTS. So HTS, which is by far the larger group in Idlib, uh, is also um, quite wealthy. Uh, and the reason it's quite wealthy is that it's the it's the dominant force in an economy of about three million people, uh, and it can tax at will. Um, uh, and therefore, and therefore, yes, it does have resources. And one of the reasons I think that HAD, although HAD is very critical of HTS and sees it as being in some way having sort of slightly betrayed its al-Qaeda origins. Uh, nevertheless, HAD is A, smaller, and B, poorer, and therefore um, and therefore has to be a little bit careful about the extent to which they, they pick a fight with HTS. Okay, we have a microphone here in the front. <coughs> mm -hmm. Ayman Abdenour, Syrian Christians for Peace. You answered most of my questions, so I'll just amend a little bit uh, of it. Among those 25,000 still alive, uh, I think there's 12,000 in the jail with the SDC, the, the Kurds, uh, arrested in jail. And there's also the woman that just came for logistic issue and the part that went back to their home countries and they are arrested there. Is there any estimate of the male fighters still alive from those 25,000 rough estimate? And the second question, which is, which is in the, uh, the, the, the conscience of all Syrians, ISIS finished and arrested and in jail, and they are the one that claimed, or the Syrian regime claimed that they are, uh, they kidnapped the two bishops. Until now, after all this, their leaders killed, in jail, arrested, investigated, and now there's no sign which part of them and who this big issue. Do you have anything about this kidnapping those two important Syrian bishops from ISIS? 
So uh, on the latter point, I'm afraid the answer is no. I, I, I have nothing new on that. Um, on the number of fighting age males, I mean, the, these, these calculations are very, very approximate. I should stress that I don't think there's anything like 12,000 FTFs uh, detained or you know, held by the Kurdish militias or by the, by the, you know, the, the, the militias in uh, northeastern Syria. I think the number of, num the number of, of foreign terrorist fighters uh, in that kind of uh, holding arrangement is much, much lower than that. Of course, there are many, um, there are many Syrians and Iraqis uh, amongst who are, who are in that kind of detention or that kind of holding arrangement. Um, so uh, I think in terms of fighting age, I think it's too difficult to give a figure, but I think the way Matt described it, just the, just the, just the proportion of a much higher original number gives you a, a problem that is clearly of a dimension that is considerably larger than what we saw with Al-Qaeda. I don't think i go further than that. Okay. Kate, over here in the middle. Kate Bauer from the Washington Institute. Edmund, thank you for such a thorough uh, presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions on the financing side of things. One, a, a quick follow-up on your comments about Haras al-Din's financing made me think of how over the last few years, we've heard less and less about external financing for these groups. Um, and if, if they're indeed struggling, is this no longer a concern or, or that there might be funding coming from outside? Um, and then on the Islamic State, um, you know, we're very familiar with this number, anywhere from 50 to $300 million in reserves. Um, one question would be if you have any sense of, of kind of the burn rate of it, because, uh, you know, this is a, a stock now, whereas previously we saw missile raising, you know, their ability to raise funds was, was, uh, was, was quite significant with the control of territory, and that's no longer the case. Um, but also, I'm wondering how this figures into recruitment, because I think there was a, a thesis in the past that um, the largesse of the organization was something that played into, you know, it wasn't the only factor, but possibly a factor in recruitment, um, both, you know, by provinces, they could pay more potentially than other groups operating in the same area. Um, and of provinces, that part of the motivation possibly for making allegiance was was based on um, the kind of return they might get from that. So does his, have you seen that dynamic change in any way? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll try and be brief, although it's a big subject. Um, uh, I think the, the first one is perhaps e easier to answer. I mean, I think with... Um, external funding still occurs. Of course it does. Um, I think what is less the case than if you go back you know, into history where you've got quite a lot of state sponsorship. Um, that sort of thing is largely at an end. Not, you know, I don't want to say it's an end, but, it's, uh, it, it, but there's much less of it than there used to be. I think, I think as people realized you know, the, 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 the danger um, that, 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 um, that people fighting these kind of conflicts Represent uh, the sort of the subsequent risk. You know what happened. What do they do afterwards? Where I think that has been quite a disincentive, um, and and so people. I think people are more careful than they used to be, but I think on a private level, I'm afraid that there's still a lot, um, and I think that's certainly true of funding of the Taliban as well. Um, okay, the Taliban mainly relies on um, the drug trade uh, and and its sort of ability to uh, control. Um, areas where 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 poppy is grown and uh, and attacks that whole associated industry, um, but uh, they do get some of, they still get money because of sort of habits of relationships and affection and bonds that go back a long period from a lot of private donors outside Afghanistan, and I think probably the same is true uh, with Al Qaeda. They also they also get quite a lot of sort of legacy. Funding from from private individuals, um, so I think I think that's that's still an issue, and people I think perhaps perhaps need to be sensitised to that because it's, it becomes an enforcement issue for the uh, for the governments wherever those uh, individuals may be located. Um, on the other point, ISIL, um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. This is this is now um, a an amount of money rather than uh, rather than a sort of a, a, an income. Um, and so from ISIL's point of view, they are conscious of the fact that they can't simply um, 
they can't be complacent about. They, they they have a lot of money by the standards of a terrorist group, but from their perspective, you know, that money will not last forever. Um, it's made them very cautious about the way that they spend money. It's made them insist that their remote provinces should be um, financially self-sufficient if possible. Um, money still flows from ISIL to the remote provinces, but not large sums. Um, and money also will sometimes flow in the other direction. And it's been described to me as a sort of a, um, a sort of circulation of money um, according to where there's need and according to where there's capability to, to donate. So, you know, if, uh, if there's some, if one of the remote provinces has a very successful, uh, you know, sort of um, fundraising for one reason or another, um, they, may, they, they, they will remit some of that. Um, and that money get, may get redeployed to some more, more needy location. Um, but ISIL still wants to maintain the sort of the bonds of obligation from sending money out, even if it's not particularly large quantities. I think in terms of their liabilities, their obligations, I think it's, I think it's welfare is the biggest one, uh, welfare, and, welfare and sort of salaries. Um, and, and, that, and that will cumulatively be a strategic burden to them. Um, they, there's a significant amount of money that, for example, they're paying to widows and orphans in, in, in Iraq, uh, people who were, you know, were associated with, uh, with, 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 uh, with ISIL. Um, and, and of course, from their point of view, that buys uh, in, in enduring loyalty, enduring attachment. And so they want to continue to do that, but it costs them a lot. And so again, they, they, they can't afford to be complacent. Um, definitely, People are expected to find ways of raising money, and you know, you saw I saw Khorasan was doing a lot in Nangarhar with, with the timber trade. You know, they were sort of they would sort of plug into local resources, um, some degree of theft, some some degree of just you know, protection money, extortion, taxation, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then in other countries, you know, it'll be it'll be a different uh, resource or a different approach. Kidnapping for ransom, of course, very much in vogue in some places, um, and. But it's, I think it's. I think you're right to highlight it as a. It's a potential weakness for them, but at the moment we're not hearing that this sum is draining away. I think you know, because they're they don't have much income anymore, but they also don't have as large liabilities. So I think we have to continue to regard them as being, at least potentially, um, very well funded. It's a good opportunity for me to, to plug the actual report itself, especially analysts and journalists. There's lots of great nuggets in here in this regard. I was My attention was drawn, for example, uh, to this passing reference to uh, informal money service businesses, Hawala effectively, mm -hmm. operating in al Hal, and people in al Hal being able to get money from their relatives around the world, even in this camp in the middle of nowhere, um, which I think is a little bit counterintuitive. Can we have a mic in the back for Jeff, and, and then we'll go over here. Yeah. Sorry, Jeff Seldon with VOA. Thanks very much uh, again for doing this. Two questions, one quick, one a little bit more involved. First, uh, earlier you said that uh, it's important to figure out exactly who the new leader of ISIS is. Some of the uh, intelligence agencies, militaries have come out and say they're pretty sure that it's Haji Abdullah, goes by other names too. But why is it important to know who it is? What difference does that make in the long term? Uh, second question you, know, you talk about the number of foreign terrorist fighters who, who are walking around still. What about the impact that ISIS has had in changing the, the landscape with all the kids who have been either traumatized because of the war or even more so indoctrinated? Um, we don't hear, we hear, you know, when I talk to people, I hear them saying, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Is anything being done about that on any sort of scale? Or is this going to have major ramifications down the line because nothing's happening? Thank you. Yeah, great questions. Um, I, I think on the ISIL leader, um, member states differ on this. I, 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 some member states will say that it's very important. Um, others will say, you know, it's that the, the idea of ISIL will live on anyway. So does it really matter? And, and they'll point to the videos, you know, with all these all these guys uh, in the remote provinces uh, pledging allegiance to uh, Abu Ibrahim or Haji Abdullah. If it's, uh, I think, you know, that, that question of Again, Haji Abdullah is yet another name that doesn't tell you very much. Um, but uh, but but uh, I tend to lean towards the former analysis. I think it does matter. 
I think it matters because I think the quality of leadership is important in any group. And I think one of the reasons that Al-Qaeda, although it's been resilient, has not been particularly dynamic is because I don't think that Ayman al-Zawahiri has been a particularly dynamic leader. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think, I think, I think, you know, the caliber of the new guy does, ma does matter. Um, and I think also there is that question about how do you keep people engaged? It's one thing to say, right, you know, it's time to stand up and shout your allegiance to this guy. Um, and, you know, we will never be defeated. You know, you can kill Baghdadi, but we're still here. But of course, it's it's for the it's for the long haul. You know, how do those people feel a year from now or five years from now, if there's this leader with this you know name which means nothing, um, and which of course people are very suspicious of the name because because Al Qureshi is a claim to heritage and lineage which um, Al Mola maybe does not possess if it is Al Mola. Um, not a whole lot of maybe there. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, so, so, so exactly. But, you know, the, the point is, why have they done it? They've done it because they think it matters. They think it matters to give this person credibility uh, and authority, um, which shows that they worry about it. And I think the communication point, I mean, Baghdadi took great risks by communicating. And, you know, it's quite possible that his death was, you know, related to the risks that he took to communicate. Um, so, you know, ISIL are now being very careful, very cautious, if they go the whole, you know, all the other way and say, okay, well, this, we're not going to expose this guy's flank at all, and he'll remain a sort of a mysterious figure, I think there's a risk there. I think there's a risk there is a risk of people slightly losing interest, not least because this is an organization that has suffered so many defeats recently. It's, it has to worry about its image and its reputation. Um, second point um, about the changed landscape. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an incredibly important subject. It's also a very delicate subject because, you know, we mustn't forget that miners are miners, and miners miners have, uh, you know, a whole set of legal protections, uh, and you know, and rightly so. Um, so, um, as people look at this, um, you know, could a could a thirteen year old be a deadly threat? Well, of course. I mean, you know, it'd be absurd to pretend otherwise. But at the same time, can a thirteen year old be? be treated or should a 13 year old be treated the same way you would treat a you know 25 year old the answer is definitely you can't um, and so th th re it's a really difficult and sensitive issue I think that the the guidance such as it is from the UN um, on this is to very much to promote the view which is taken by the United States by uh, Russia by um, a number of other member states in the central in Central Asia, in um, in, in southeast southeastern Europe, and 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 and, and a lot and in a lot of Africa and the Middle East as well, which is that member states must get on the front foot and get their nationals back, and not leave them in a limbo in which they're going to become increasingly desperate and possibly increasingly radicalized. So um, the, the, there's been quite a lot of promotion of the Kazakh. Um, uh, initiative to bring um, uh, bring a lot of their uh, females and children back from the conflict zone and then put them through a, a rehabilitation program in Kazakhstan which is not aimed at punishment but aimed entirely at uh, entirely at reintegration um, it's um, of course it's a risk you know I mean if it, there may be maybe instances where, where, where that will cause some local tension because people find out that they've got people there amongst them who have been, been you know, in Syria. Uh, although, you know, the, I think Kazakhstan will do all it can to try to, try to prevent that from, you know, to, 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 to give them some cover, give them some, um, dis, some discreet, uh, you know, um, uh, some cover for what they've done. But it's going to be very difficult to do that. Nevertheless, they feel that they're, preliminary look at those, that group is that this is by far the best way of addressing and mitigating the risk and, and the UN broadly backs that assessment. Eric, the corner. Eric Schmidt with the New York Times. Uh, I wonder if you could address uh, a couple of the other Al-Qaeda affiliates. One, Al AQAP, which reportedly lost its leader in the last several days, Qasem al -Rimi. Uh, a blow to an organization that already was seemed to be flagging with the strikes in, in Yemen. And then secondly, uh, Al-Shabaab, uh, particularly after the, the attack they conducted on the, uh, the base in Manda Bay 
and the increasing focus by American officials where they talk about Shabab not only as a regional threat, but even a, even a potential threat to the U.S. homeland, which struck my ear as is something a little bit new. Um, interested to hear your thoughts on those two. Sure. Um, I, mean, I think on Yemen, Yemen is a strange one. I, 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 I don't know why the fortunes of AQAP and, and, and ISIL have been so patchy in Yemen. Um, you know, it was obviously one of the places people worried about in this connection. But they did decide to go at each other's throats. Um, and, and they're still doing it. Um, and I think that's clearly a large part of why ISIL has, I mean, ISIL is very weak in Yemen. It really is, you know, it's, it's, it's generally had the worst of the exchanges with, uh, with AQAP. Um, and, you know, whereas at one point it was seen as a potentially emerging uh, affiliate, it's, these days it's really regarded as, as having almost completely stalled. Um, and AQAP also, you know, um, I think has, again, taken a lot of attrition of that kind. I think AQAP has been around the boy of controlling territory a couple of times, as you know, and made themselves visible, made themselves very targetable. And they also made themselves very high priority for the international community because of the threat to aviation. Um, so I, I think maybe that also has to some degree caught up with them over time. Um, and, and, and sort of, you know, sort of slightly, slightly odd dynamics um, with, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, some of the some elements within ISIL and AQAP having having maybe colluded a little bit with Ali Abdullah Saleh when he was still alive. And, and uh, there's I, th I think I think the games that they've played in Yemen have not served them well. And certainly it feels like a much weaker uh, AQAP doesn't feel like the the beast that it once was, and, and as you know, they lost uh, they lost uh, Assyri, the uh, master bomb maker, some time ago, back in 2017. Um, so yeah, if they've lost Qasem Arimi as well, uh, we don't have that absolutely confirmed, but there's an awful lot of chatter about it. Um, uh, it's, it wouldn't be surprising if if it had happened, um, but you know, I'll wait for sort of clear confirmation. Uh, it would be no great surprise, um, and I think. Um, I think unless they get their act together and stop scrapping for small, uh, small areas within Yemen against ISY, um, then then it's hard to see either group uh, recovering much. Uh, on on, on Al Shabab, um, yeah, it's Al Shabab is is very strong, very resilient. Um, it's been going for an awfully long time. It knows what it's doing. It's got fairly stable sources of income. It's done that, um, it's managed to pull that trick of supplanting state authority in some areas and people going to Al-Shabaab courts for, you know, for sort of Sharia judgments and things like that. Um, so it, it is formidable. Um, it's able to project a threat certainly uh, across the border into neighboring countries. We've seen that very clearly. That question about uh, a more projecting a, a, an even more sophisticated or remote international threat. Um, there's not much evidence to support that, but there was, uh, as I'm sure you saw, um, an Al-Qaeda-affiliated guy who was pursuing, a, um, who was pursuing pilot training uh, in the Philippines who was arrested. And I think the very fact that that was even happening suggests a... Uh, a an intelligence at work in al-Shabaab that is at least looking at those more ambitious international ambitions. Now, I don't know how developed they are. And of course, this particular case obviously didn't end well for them. Um, but um, I think I think I would say that at the moment, there's no evidence of a of a present threat outside the immediate region. But it would be right to continue to monitor it. Do you think that one reason people talk about that is because of the regional affiliates of Al-Qaeda, Shabab has among the broader uh, international scope of, of foreign fighters, not necessarily in terms of number, but just from a very large swath of especially the Western world. Yeah, it's, that's, definitely, that's definitely a factor. Yeah, it, it's certainly a factor. And it's also, it's also a factor that I think because there are, there's a, you know, a, a very substantial Somali diaspora with, um, where, which in some cases has, uh, has become caught up in, um, in, in networks of one sort or another. So you know, again, you, one mustn't talk about these things as being, um, you know, you can't, you can't stigmatize a, po a, a population, but if, 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 if you have radicalized 
uh, communities in places like um, Central or South Africa. Mm. Um, that can also be a, that can also be an issue in terms of slightly internationalizing the perspective. Sure. Um, I have to call on Aaron Zellin because, unless I misread the report, there is only one non-governmental citation in your report, and it's actually two to a report by Aaron Zellin. So respect, uh, Aaron. Thank you. Um, before I ask my question, though, I did want to shout out a new report we just launched here at the Washington Institute about Idlib by uh, Ayman al-Tamimi. So for those interested, it gives sort of a really on-the-ground look at all the various players um, in relation to what's going on in Idlib and what the Assad regime as well as their allies in Russia and Iran are doing. Because they've been taking over more territory um, and the fact that, um, you know, Hura Sadin has these interests in external operations, do you think because there's less chance of some of these areas holding on that there's more likely chance that we'll see in an actual external operation in Europe or in the U.S. by Hura Sadin? And if so, do you think it would be sort of this classic Al-Qaeda style, or do you think maybe they've learned something from ISIS with sort of these like virtual planner type um, attacks too? Thank you. I mean, it's, it's a great question. I, 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 there's not a great deal I can add to your expertise on this, I think. Um, what I would say, I mean, I mentioned the, I mentioned the, the shortage of resource, and that, that does seem to affect them, and I think that may reflect a, a sort of a longer-term caution within Al-Qaeda, which, you know, I, I don't know at what point Al-Qaeda will sort of shrug off that sort of rather cautious approach. Maybe they feel that they shouldn't, but, but whether, that, whether that's something they can really just carry on indefinitely, I'm not so sure. And, of course, if we do see a leadership change in Al-Qaeda, that can make a difference. Um, I think... The presence in in, in northwest Syria, um, Huras ad -Din, some people are now calling it AQS, you know, Al Qaeda uh, Syria, uh, to try and be clear that it's that that's the Al Qaeda global agenda rather than H rather than HTS, which is you know which is you know more national in its focus. Um, it's it's hard. They, they they've chosen a very difficult arena in which to operate. So it's fine to have a it's fine to have an arena in which you in which you can be present in which you can be organised. You've got your, uh, you know, you've got the insight the believers operations room, and um, so you know this is it's a serious thing to have all of this going on in this enclave. But the enclave is under such pressure, um, and the factors that impact on the groups there are are complex as well. Um, that I think I think at the moment what you have is a, a lot of ambition and a lot of potential. But I think limited ability to connect that with external effect. But if they can, if they can turn that, if they can turn that trick at some point, yes, you know, I mean, as, as you say, if, so, if, so if the military situation goes very much against them, and then somehow or other these people are elsewhere um, and still able to organise, not actually, because of course, you know, while you're under pressure, military pressure, and trying to survive and trying to fight. Um, you know, defend territory. I think it is. I think it is difficult to maintain. Or is it difficult to progress external at attack ambitions? I think. Um, but interesting trend there is that it seems as if the foreign terrorist fighter element in Al Nusra Front, uh, sorry, in HTS, um, is gradually bleeding away from them and into HAD. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the things we've heard from from member states. And therefore, you know that the it was the proportion of of, H, of FTFs was always much lower in HTS than in HAD, but the absolute number, because HTS is a far bigger group, was you know relatively similar. Whereas now it seems to be that even the absolute number with HAD is much greater than the absolute number with HTS, and that I think is the the bottom line. There is that it's very hard to imagine that a group that is now predominantly composed of FTFs is not ultimately going to find a way of projecting an external threat. So I, I, think, I think people are right to worry about it, but I, I suspect that the threat is not imminent. It's the sign of a compelling speaker and a compelling topic when you've run overtime and we still had two hands up. I apologize to the two people we weren't able to get to during the formal session. I want to thank everybody uh, for taking the time this afternoon. Please join me in thanking Edmund for taking the time today. Uh, we really appreciate it. This was a real tour de force. Thank you very much. Everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.